Great. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Lila Sales, and I am an author. I am the author of seven different books for kids and teenagers. You can see some of their covers here. Um, I have been publishing books since 2010, um, and uh, probably my most my best well my most well known book is called "This Song Will Save Your Life." Um, that one has been optioned for potentially being a movie, which would be really cool. Um, and it's also been translated into 12 different languages. Uh, so you can see some of the foreign covers here. Um, it's cool to see like all the different languages that it's in. I don't know if you speak any of these languages, if you can read any of them. Um, the only one I know is the Spanish, but the rest of them I've been able to figure out. Um, and also just seeing like all the different countries around the world, what their different publishers do with the book cover. Uh, my newest book, is called The Campaign, and it's going to be coming out in August. It's uh, middle grade, so that means it's for like eight to 12 year olds, and it's an illustrated political comedy. Um, so I don't have finished copies yet, but I have like an early version of it here, um, which you can see has like some, it's going to be illustrated, as I said, so it has like some sketches in it and stuff like that, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you all a little about um, how a book gets made. So um, both how I became a writer, but then also with each one of my books um, and every book that you encounter in a bookstore, how it went from being just like an idea in an author's brain uh, to being an actual book that you can pick up and read on the shelves. Um, so, and along the way, I'm going to tell you guys some secrets about being an author and how the publishing industry works, uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily know just from, just from reading books. Um, so to tell you a little bit about how I got here, I will say I have always loved to read and I have always loved to write. So when I was a kid, pretty much all I did was read all the time. You like could not get a picture of me without a book in front of my face. Uh, and I would just like consume books and often I would read the same books over and over and over again. Um, sometimes adults would tell me like, you know, you need to read something new or you need to read something more challenging or, um, and, but I, once I found a book that I loved, I just wanted to read it over and over again. And actually that was a big part of how I ultimately became a writer was like by reading the same thing repeatedly I would ultimately come to understand like how it worked. Um, like I could sort of take apart the pieces and that then allowed me to be able to put them back together as an author now in my own right. Um, so I started, in addition to reading, I started telling stories from the time I was really young. Like here's a picture of something that I wrote and drew when I was like six years old um, that my parents saved in a box in the basement. Um, seems to be about like a princess and her friend who is a duck. Um, I wrote my first uh, like novel length book when I was 11. Um, and this is a page from it here. I wrote the whole thing by hand um, because I wasn't very good at typing yet. I was a lot slower at typing than I was but at writing by hand, which is now like the opposite of that. I try and write like two sentences by hand now and my hand really hurts. Um, but uh, so I started, I actually started submitting um, this book to publishers when I was in middle school. I was 11 years old when I started sending this out to publishers. Um, but it actually wasn't until I'd written another six manuscripts and was 25 years old that I actually got, um, I got a deal for my first book to be published. Um, this is me uh, when I was 15. And um, and I really wanted to be an author when I grew up. Um, and, um, but I also like, didn't really have a sense of how getting like the business of getting books published worked at all. Um, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to talk to you guys about like, um, how it happens. So you start out with an idea, obviously, and ideas can come from anywhere. Um, a lot of my ideas come from what I was doing in my life when I was a teenager, um, when I looked like that. Um, so for example, my book, Past Perfect, is 
um, about a girl who works at a living history village. Like she dresses up as a colonial reenactor and gives tours of this place that's basically like Colonial Williamsburg. And that's based on a summer job that I had when I was 18. Um, my book, Mostly Good Girls, is set at a place that's very much like my high school. Um, so it's sort of like every experience you have, um, you don't necessarily know it at the time, but it can ultimately be helpful in coming up with an idea later in your life. Um, so, and ideas can percolate for a very long time. You know, there are, I'll sort of have bits and pieces of story ideas that float around in my mind often for years. Um, and I don't know exactly what to do with them. You know, it's something that like, maybe sounds like a cool concept. Maybe I'll even write down a few pages or a few chapters, um, but I don't necessarily know how to turn it into a full-fledged novel um, until like other pieces start getting filled in. Sometimes I'll have like a number of different ideas in kind of different areas. Um, and then it will occur to me like, oh, hey, I could combine these all um, into one story. So like, that's what I did, for example, with The Song Will Save Your Life, which I was showing you all the foreign covers for earlier. Um, I really like um, indie music. I'm a big fan of like music and dance parties. And um, I'm really interested in DJs, though I'm not a DJ myself. So I wanted to write a book about a girl, a teenage girl who became a DJ. Um, but I didn't really know what the plot would be. That was just kind of like the premise. Um, and then also, uh, I was bullied a lot when I was in middle school, and so I similarly wanted to write a book about a girl who experiences bullying and sort of like what that does to your sense of self. Um, and I wanted to write both of those books for many years, and it took me a long time to realize that if I combined them into one book, if it was about a girl who was bullied at school and then found the place where she really belonged as a DJ, that was actually a more complete book. Um, and that's ultimately what this song will save your life wound, wound up being. So you start with your idea um, or a bunch of ideas and then you start writing. And you write and you write and you write until you have a first draft. Um, and writing a first draft can take any length of time. Um, it usually takes me, depending on the length of the book, um, it usually takes me about a year. Um, sometimes it can take less um, if I, really know what it is that I'm trying to say and the book is pretty simple. Uh, sometimes it can take more than that. Like with uh, my last book that came out, which was called If You Don't Have Anything Nice to Say, that one took me almost two years to get the first uh, full draft. Um, and the reason why was that I, like I knew what the conflict was. Um, I could set that up very well. So I got, you know, 100 pages into it and that was all good, but I really didn't know what the resolution was going to be. Um, so I couldn't reach an ending um, for a very long time. So after you have a first draft, um, you will probably want to get feedback on it. Um, and feedback can come from a variety of places. So some of it is just going to be like from you yourself, you like set the draft aside, for a little bit to sort of get some distance from it so you can read it with fresh eyes. Um, and then when you read it again, you're able to see like, oh, here are the bits that don't really make sense, that don't fit together, um, you know, so on and so forth. But also you might get feedback from teachers or from friends, from other writers who you know. Uh, a lot of people use Wattpad or join critique groups. Um, there are all sorts of places online where you can connect with other writers. Um, who write in all different genres, who are at all different places in their career, um, and then you give one another feedback. Um, and I think one of the really wonderful things about doing that um, is not just that you get advice that helps you make your own book better, um, but that as you learn to give advice to other writers, I think you often come up with things that will help you yourself. It's a lot easier when you're reading somebody else's book to notice where the problems are, to read and to be like, oh, like, you know, the middle is boring, or the logic doesn't make sense, or, um, you know, the resolution feels like it comes out of nowhere, or things like that. And it's, um, it's easy to see those things in other people's work, but it's harder to see those things in our own work. Um, so as you get into the habit of looking for them, you can then, like, apply that to, um, like kind of being self-critical, like giving yourself feedback on your own writing. So you go out there, you get feedback, and then based on the notes that you receive, 
you revise. Um, and because this is still pretty early on, it's probably going to be a pretty major revision. So I'm not just talking about uh, tweaking a few words or a few lines here or there. It might be um, big plot lines, you know, changing around um, perspective or, you know, what what format or age group the book is for, introducing or taking away whole plot lines. Um, you know, I was I was talking earlier about if you don't have anything nice to say and how long it took me to create that. Um, and that's because, as I said, I was trying to figure out sort of the second half of the book. And I did three completely different versions of what the second half of that book looked like. I mean, they had nothing in common. In each of the three, um, the main character goes to a different place, interacts with different people. Um, it's, you know, one was kind of a mystery, one was, um, I don't know, she like steals her sister's identity. Like anyway, none of that was where I wound up was where I wound up. Um and it can feel frustrating uh writing so much that doesn't ultimately go in the finished book. Like if you read if you don't have anything nice to say now, you would never know that there had once been two completely other endings and all these characters who didn't make it into the finished book. Um, but what you have to remember is that that process of kind of like writing out all the things that don't make it in there are how you ultimately find the things that do belong in there. So even when it seems like a waste, um, that actually you would never get the actual book, the actual manuscript, the actual words that you want if you didn't take the time to do all the things that don't ultimately belong in there. Um, so after you revise, um, and you may revise a couple times, you ultimately have a manuscript that hopefully you feel pretty good about. Um, and so then if you're, if you're looking to get that manuscript published through a traditional publisher, uh, as I was, then the next thing you do is you go out and you look for an agent. Um, so you do a lot of querying of agents. There are tons and tons of literary agents out there. Um, and the job of a literary agent basically is to represent a writer um, to publishing houses. They like represent your interests um, financially, creatively, and sort of like free you up to do the writing. Um, an agent, of course, will also have feedback for you. And so then, oops, then you will revise again um, based on what the agent has to say. Um, then once you have revised to the point where the literary agent is like, yeah, this is good. This is something I'm excited to represent and I wanna, um, you know, I'm ready to start submitting it. Um, then the agent will take the manuscript out on submission and they will send it to editors at a lot of different publishing houses. Um, and the job of an editor is to uh, consider all of these different submissions that are coming in and try to decide which ones they should acquire for their publishing house, which, one they sh which ones they should publish. Um, and then once they have decided to publish a book, um, then their, the editor's job is to shepherd that book through to publication. Um, so you go on a submission and hopefully uh, one of the editors who the manuscript is submitted to will want to acquire it. Um, and so they will then make an offer to the, to the literary agent. Um, and the offer will be, you know, it's, it comes in the form of a very long contract, um, you know, maybe like 20 pages of legal wording. And it says all sorts of stuff about both what you're getting paid up front for the book. Um, that's what the advance is. Also, like what royalties are going to be, um, which is to say, like, for every copy that sells, um, you'll get a tiny bit more money. Um, but then also all sorts of things about what rights are included, when they have to publish the book by, what kind of say the author gets in various things, what happens when the book goes out of print, just kind of like, like any contract, it has to account for like every single possible thing that might happen. Um, so after they have acquired it, um, then the editor will write you an editorial letter. Um, and this is going to be like the most serious, professional, helpful feedback that you get through the whole process because an editor's job really is giving you feedback um, on, on stories and how to make them stronger. So an editorial letter could easily be 10 pages long, single spaced, and it goes through 
every aspect of the story that might need improvement. So it talks about the characters and their relationships and the plot and the premise and the logic and the writing style and every little thing and what's working, what's not working. Um, and mostly an editorial letter asks, is the editor asking you, the author, a lot of questions. So rather than the editor being prescriptive and telling you like, here are the changes you have to make, it's more sort of like, okay, this is your book, um, but here are a bunch of questions that I have about this and I want you to figure out ways to answer them on the page. Um, so then, of course, you revise again um, based on what's in the editorial letter. You will notice a pattern here. It's a lot of revision. Um, and you might do a few rounds of this, actually. You might get a couple editorial letters, um, hopefully, as you zero in on what the book is supposed to actually look like. Um, and then at some point, um, when you're getting really close, then the editor will go in on like a more granular level and they'll start like marking up the manuscript line by line of saying like, oh, you know, this line is redundant or, you know, I don't understand this line and um, so on and so forth. So then when you finally have a manuscript that your editor is like, yeah, it's good. Like that's, that's the story you've written it is done. Then it goes to the copy editor. Um, who is totally different from the, the normal editor who you've been working with. The copy editor's job is to go through and look for grammatical mistakes um, and, um, you know, basically the sort of like, you know, misspellings and um, incorrect facts. Um, that sort of copy editors like know a little bit about everything and are very good at doing research. So if you put something in your book where you're like, oh, you know, she drove from, um, you know, she left Austin and she got to San Antonio 25 minutes later, um, then the copy editor's job is to flag that and be like, no, you can't do that drive in 25 minutes. Um, like, you know, please see here on Google Maps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so copy editors are very smart people who are interested in pretty much everything. Um, and uh, copy editing is actually the sort of feedback that we're most accustomed to in like English class at school. You know, often when you get a paperback from a teacher, um, a lot of the things that they're marking on it are like grammatical or spelling um, or typos. And those are the things that a copy editor uh, will catch at a book publishing company. So the copy editor then sends you all of their notes and you can probably guess what you do next. You revise. Uh, then once you've done that, then you have a clean copy edited manuscript. Um, and that's what the book is going to be. However, it doesn't look like a book yet, right? Like it just looks like a document on your computer. So this is where a designer comes in and they take this text and they start setting it um, so that it looks like the format of an actual book. Um, and they have to make all sorts of decisions. So they're deciding um, everything about the way that a book looks. So they're deciding the size of the page and what font they're using and how much space there is between letters, how much space there is between lines, what the chapter numbers and chapter headings look like, what the numbers on each page look like and where they go. Um, if you ever look up at a book, if you ever look at a book, um, you have to think like it's not just the content, literally every single thing that's on that page, a designer decided where it should be on there. Um, and then a designer is also going to be figuring out what the book cover looks like, um, trying to make it something that seems appropriate for the book and that also people will want to pick up. Um, so once they've designed it, uh, it now looks like a book. It then, those files that they have created get sent off to someone at the publishing company who is in charge of production. Um, and their job is getting the files to like the actual manufacturer of physical books. Um, and that process alone actually can take uh, a number of months because a lot of books are printed in China. And so it takes a long time for the books to be printed there and then shipped back here. Even for books that are printed in America, um, it can be a process of a couple months um, just to like go through all the printing, then like, you know, ship them out to the warehouses where they belong, um, so on and so forth. But it's a book, it publishes. Um, but even then the work is not done um, because it's, you now have this wonderful book that you've been working on at this point probably for a couple of years. 
Um, and you're really proud of it. And lots of people have helped you make it what it is today. Um, but you need other people out there to make sure that anybody knows that your book even exists. Because if you ever go into a bookstore or a library, you'll know there are thousands upon thousands of books out there. Um, and thousands of new books are getting published every year. Uh, and so there's the question of like, how does anybody find out that a new book is coming out? How do you even find out that it's something that you want to read? So this is where your sales team becomes involved. Um, the sales team also works for the publisher and their job is to um, go to every place that might carry a book and try to convince them to carry your book. So they're going to um, independent bookstores like Blue Willow and Book People. Um, and then they're also going to chains like um, Books A Million and Barnes and Noble. They're going to Amazon. Um, they're going to libraries. They're going to like every place that might carry books and telling them like, we have this new book coming out and we think that you should carry it and here's why. Um, but then even once it's on these shelves at libraries and stores where you can pick it up, um, again, a lot of books are there. So in order for you to know that that one's there, uh, this is where marketing and publicity comes into play. So at a publishing company, there's also going to be a big team of marketing and publicity. And their job is every, basically every time you see a thing about a book that's not the book itself, that is thanks to marketing and publicity. So if you ever hear an author interviewed on the radio or on a podcast, or you see an interview with them on a website, or you see an advertisement for a book, or you um, get a bookmark for a book, you go into a bookstore and they have, um, you know, they have a display for a book. There's a poster for a book or about the author. Um, anything like that um, is coming through the team of marketing and publicity. Um, and so all of these people work all together in order to make sure that the book exists, that it's good, that it's uh, professional, it's attractive to look at, it's getting into stores, and then ultimately it's getting to you, the reader. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, um, the design part specifically because so because there are so many people involved in this process, um, a publishing company might employ hundreds of people. Um, one of the challenges is that all those people need to agree on some things. Um, and so one of the things that they all need to agree on is the cover. Um, because you need a cover that both like the author feels like, yeah, I like that cover. Um, I, that feels like a fair representation of my book to me. Um, you know, it's something that I'm going to be happy to have on my website and to have a bunch of copies up on my bookcase, so on and so forth. Um, also something that the editor feels like, yeah, this is, you know, this is a fair representation of the book, but then also something that sales and marketing feel like, um, yeah, people will, you know, people will buy this book based on this cover. They will pick it up. They will want to look at it. Um, and so often that's challenging because you can have really different perspectives there. What sales and marketing is looking for can sometimes be really different from what the author um, thinks their book should be. So for my book, if you don't have anything nice to say, we went through a bunch of different cover um, approaches. Um, so these are some of the early versions that they sent me. So they really liked this, they, the publisher, really liked this um, like format for the design, but we spent a long time trying to figure out kind of like who the girl is um, and how much of her to show, what part of her to show, what facial expression she should have, so on and so forth. Um, and so both of these felt like a little silly to me. Um, the book is about a girl who uh, posts something offensive online and it goes viral um, and her whole life is um, kind of explodes over that. Um, and so, you know, it is, it is humorous in places, but it's not a light book. And both of these felt just kind of like, I don't know, like light and quirky. Um, so we kept going, trying to find like the right, the right girl. We went through these as well. Um, sometimes designers are just looking through, <clears throat> are just looking through uh, stock photos, which I think is what the designer was doing in this place. There are websites that are just filled with stock photos that, um, you know, that you can use for any sort of purpose. Sometimes, um, 
publishers will do an actual photo shoot for a book cover, or of course they'll hire an illustrator for an illustrated book cover. Um, you can see as we were going through all this, I was not convinced by either of these girls either. Um, you can see that we were keeping the same overall design and we were keeping the same font. Like I liked that font, um, but you can also see that we didn't even have a title in there yet because we hadn't yet decided on what the title was. So we got closer here with the one on the left and then finally the one on the right is where we wound up. Um, you can see we ultimately changed the font a little bit um, and finally put in the real title once we figured out what the real title was going to be. Um, figuring out a title is another part of it that's really challenging and you might go through a bunch of different titles in the course of um, from the time that you start a book to the time that it comes out on shelves. Um, so here, for example, this was my first book, Mostly Good Girls. And you can see on the left-hand side, I spent ages like trying to figure out a title for it. You can see on the left-hand side, a napkin on which I was like having coffee with a friend and we were just going through and brainstorming um, a bunch of possible titles for it. Um, the one that I really liked was Wayward Girls, um, which you can see has a star next to it. And um, when the editor acquired it, that's what it was called. Um, but then their sales and marketing team didn't like that as a title because um, I think they thought that the word wayward wasn't evocative, that people wouldn't know what it meant. I don't know. Um, anyway, so then ultimately we came up with Mostly Good Girls, which is how it got its title. Um, but I just, you know, I think, it's, I think it's interesting to know when you look at any book cover, like that was not the original title that I had. And I had no image of what the cover was going to be in my head. Um, so, you know, it's like when they say don't judge a book on its cover, it's not that that's right or wrong exactly. Like a cover is going to give you information about what sort of book you're looking at. That's the job of a designer is to make the cover look appealing and informative. Um, but I think it is worthwhile to know that the cover doesn't necessarily reflect anything about what the author's vision was. So overall, um, I've told you, I think, a bunch of things that people don't necessarily know about being writers. Um, to go through it again, you have to revise a lot. And I think that came across earlier as we had like four different boxes that said revision. Um, publishing a book takes a really long time. Uh, you know, as I said, even if you're writing your first draft in less than a year, even if you're writing it in a few months, um, you still have all that time with revision. But even then, like from the time that an editor acquires a book to the time that it's actually physically in bookstores, um, you're looking at at least a year, often more than that. Um, and that is again, because so many different hands are touching it along the way. So everything takes, you know, the copy editor needs their time, the designer needs their time, production needs their time, um, and so on and so forth. Um, which leads me to the third thing, which is that many, many people are involved in a book's publication. Um, and I just showed you who a bunch of them are. Um, and I think like one of the primary things that I want you all to take away from that is that like if you like books, there are so many different careers in books that are available. Um, you know, I think when I was growing up, I knew that there were authors. Um, I had an author come and speak in my school once, just like I am speaking to you right now. Um, and their names are on the covers of books. So that's how I, you know, that's how I knew that there were authors. And I think I knew there were illustrators as well. Um, but all the rest of it, I really didn't think about. Um, but there actually, there, there's so many careers in publishing, right? So there's being a literary agent, there's being a book publicist, um, production, contracts, um, subsidiary rights, uh, editors, obviously, just on and on and on. Um, there are so many people who play a huge role in making books happen. And then, of course, some people who you know as well, booksellers, librarians, teachers, um, you know, if they weren't out there, um, books would not get into people's hands. Um, so, you know, really just make the point of like, if you, if you like books, and if you want to work with books someday, there are so many different ways that you can do that. Um, authors get a say over what's inside the book, but they don't necessarily get to get a say on what's on the outside of the book. Um, and also that uh, authors are normal people, just like you. Um, you know, part of the reason why I was showing you all 
photos of me from when I was a kid was to show you like, like I really just, I started out just like a normal kid who just happened to be very into books. Um, and, uh, and I think it's just to the point of like, you don't have to be anybody special or specific in order to become a writer. You don't have to like, you know, have star power or have like parents who, you know, push you into it or I, I don't know any of those things. Um, like it really just has to be something that you enjoy doing and that you do a lot. Um, and I really believe that everyone is a writer um, and everyone has a valuable story to tell. I don't think that everybody needs to do it professionally, um, which, even though that's what I did. Um, but I think regardless of whether you ever want anyone else to read your work, I just think there's an inherent good in writing down what you're thinking about, like what stories are interesting to you. Um, every individual has his or her own perspective on this world and his or her own experiences. And nobody else is going to be having the same ideas and perspective and experiences that you are. So it's like, if you don't write that down, um, then no one else will. Um, and I think particularly now, you know, it's like, this is obviously, this is a difficult time that we're in. It's, um, it's confusing, it's uncertain. Um, and um, it's scary. Um, and so I find for me, like it can be hard to focus in on writing right now when it's like there's so much news going on and, um, you know, and I, I feel like I'm gonna miss something. And, um, but if I can focus in on writing um, and sort of let all of the, challenges of the real world drop away and just like go into um like a word the words and a story that i am creating um i find that really soothing like that really that really helps me to be like focused on that other place um it makes me feel good like okay i'm i'm accomplishing something even in this uh even in this state where i'm like i don't know what to do like i feel like i there's nothing i can do here um and then also I think it's like, this is how I sort of remember and process things. Like this is how I work through um, what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing is by writing it down. Um, so most of what I write never actually makes it to publication. Um, you know, even today, even though I have seven books out, um, the vast majority of stuff that I write um, never, comes together fully into a book that is going to have enough commercial appeal that we publish it. Um, but again, like the, the writing process is just kind of like part of how I understand the world. And it's something that I really recommend to everybody. So I hope after you finish this video that you'll take some time and just write a little bit for yourself as well. All right, that's what I got. Um, I think we have Sam here to ask some questions. Yes. Hi. Um, so just to start, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned rereading a lot of books as a kid. Yeah. Um, so for our readers watching this, um, what were those books that you read? The Babysitter's Club. Uh, I, and this was before The Babysitter's Club were um, graphic novels, which they are today, which is so cool. Um, but yeah, at the time, they there were probably like a hundred out, I don't know, maybe more. I loved them. And there were some that I loved more than others. I would just reread them over and over and over again. There was also another series called, um, there were like a lot of series like The Babysitter's Club at the time. Um, so there was one called The Saddle Club um, where the girls rode horses and I was very into horses. I don't, I don't actually ride. I like have barely touched horses, but I really liked like the concept of, hor of horses. So I read The Saddle Club a lot. Um, and then there was another one called The Gymnasts, and it was like The Babysitter's Club or The Saddle Club, except they all did gymnastics. And I also did gymnastics, so I read those a ton. And it was, yeah, it like would drive the teachers at school crazy. They were like, you're very smart. Like, you know a lot of words. You have a good attention span. Like, you don't need to be reading these same books over and over again. But like, that's what I loved. Yeah, that's extremely, re extremely relatable. Um, I remember being in middle school, and I would reread Twilight over and over again. So yeah, um, 
And then they'd be like, like, I remember middle school, you know, they'd be like, oh, like, these books are too young for you. Like, here, read, like, Jane Eyre instead. Mm-hmm. And I read Jane Eyre, and I was like, this has nothing to do with my life. Like, the Babysitter's Club, at least, is, like, sort of, like, my life is. Like, Jane Eyre, I was like, this seems very boring, and, like, I don't know why I should care. Yeah, so that actually brings me to my next question. Um, so do all of your books have some aspect or, like, real-life experiences that you've pulled from? Yes. Um, none of the books are about me, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, n- none of them are, like, exact, exact things that I have experienced. Like, I think, um, as someone who writes fiction, you have to be able to take liberties and, um, you know, just, like, put in what you think the story needs and not be so wedded to what your own experiences are that you, like, can't give the story the things that it needs. Um, but all of them are just like littered with like little things that I've, I've you know, little things that I've experienced um, or said or heard or seen. Um, so, and some of it of course is like straight out of my imagination. Um, but, you know, so like for example, just last night I was writing a scene where like the, you know, these kids are having a talent show. And so I was like, okay, like, what are, what are talents? What talents might someone have on a talent show? So then I just think, like, well, what are talent shows that I've seen? Like, what talents did people perform at them? Like, I, so I just put in a character who burps the alphabet. Because, um, like, I had a friend in college who could burp the alphabet. Seems like a good talent, you know? So it's just, like, very little. And, like, that character is not the girl I knew in college. She's somebody totally different. But she has this one little skill that I took from someone I knew. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and so with all of these like little ideas that you're pulling from life, um, how do you know that an idea is enough to become a book? Is that just like a feeling that you have? Do you have to work through it? Um, how do you approach that? Uh, yeah, I don't think that I ever know until I get started. Um, and sometimes I'll think something will be enough and then it turns out that it's not really. Um, I think um, often you need a lot of these ideas to come together in order to create something that really feels um, like a full book. Um, you know, and uh, I'm trying to think how to answer that because that's a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a challenging question. Um, I think sometimes you just kind of start, you have a premise, you have like a what if that seems cool and interesting to you. So like for the newest book that I have coming out, the campaign, um, the idea I had was about um, a 12 year old girl or a kid who becomes a campaign manager, a political campaign manager. And that was sort of like where I started from. Um, and cause I, I always really love stories about kids doing things that you wouldn't expect kids to usually be able to do, you know, like a kid who becomes a principal or an international spy or, you know, a race car driver, stuff like that. Um, and so I wanted to do a kid who becomes a campaign manager. Um, but like that alone is not enough for a book. So you sort of have to figure out a lot of specifics along the way of figuring out like, okay, well, whose campaign is she managing? Why is she managing this campaign? Why does she care about getting into politics at all? What sort of like personal growth is she going through as a result of this? Like, what is, what is the place where she is managing this campaign, so on and so forth. And a lot of that stuff you don't know until you start writing it, you kind of figure it out mm-hmm. along the way. Yeah, and then, you know, you talked about how much revision that you have to do um, yeah. to get to that final manuscript. And so at least for that first revision before you're gonna send it out to an agent or an editor, um, what does your revision process look like? Yeah, so, you know, I think different writers all have different revision processes. Um, so some people are very much like, you know, you just get everything out as fast as possible. Um, you, you know, you write things in any sort of order as it comes to you and then you, and then you go back and you make it work. Um, that is not so much my process. Like I am more likely to, um, revise as I go. So if I'll come to, um, you know, I'll be two thirds of the way through the book and I'll realize that I need a character who like fulfills whatever role and I don't have one in there already. Like I am apt to go back to the beginning and start adding that character in along the way um, so that they'll be there when I need them. Um, So yeah, I think that's, 
that's more that's more my revision process and i'll i'll sort of you know i try to start with um i try to start with bigger more like structural things like it doesn't make a ton of sense to be fussing with the wording in a sentence if the entire scene that that sentence appears in isn't ultimately going to wind up in the book at all yeah Awesome. So um, you talked about all of the different jobs within the publishing industry and yeah. you yourself worked as an editor for a while, right? I did, yeah. yeah. So how has your editorial work influenced your writing? Um, you know, I think a, a big part of the way is just having this understanding of how the publishing industry works mm -hmm. uh, and what it is that everybody at a publishing house is trying to um, is trying to do, like what it takes for them to do their jobs. Um, I think a lot of authors sometimes can show up. They've just worked totally in isolation for so long. Um, and then they see the publishing company as, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to ruin my book. You know, you're, you're changing things. You're uh, making it look not the way I imagined it. You're, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, I think from working in a publishing company and like knowing like, like my friends are designers and publicists and copy editors and like, you know, sort of just understanding what actually goes into their job and what I can do that makes their jobs easier and the sorts of things that authors can do that makes their jobs harder, um, I think is, is a big part of it for me. Um, and then also, I think an, another way that being an editor really helped me is a big part of the job of being an editor is reading manuscript submissions you just read so many submissions um and the vast majority of which you never publish um and so it really showed me like um what maybe like what overdone tropes were in children's books and saying like okay i've seen you know i've seen a million submissions in ya where um you know where there's a love triangle and so I'm not going to do that. Or if I do that, I'm going to come up with some uh, new spin to put on it. Um, because it's like, I know, I know what's already been done to death. Um, which is also, by the way, like something that anybody can, like if you read enough, anybody can do that. You don't have to be an editor um, in, order to, in order to find that out. Awesome. Well, um, so my last question for you is, do you have any advice for any aspiring writers or editors or anyone who wants to go into the publishing industry? Yeah. Um, so again, I think there are so many different roles in the publishing industry. Um, and so like my biggest piece of advice is just like looking at the wide variety of ways that there are for you to be involved in books. Um, my advice for aspiring writers is pretty much where I started like you have to read and you have to write um it's I mean I'm telling you I encounter so many people who are like oh that's cool that you write books like I have an idea for a book too like we are equal because we both have ideas for books and I'm like yeah but ideas are a dime a dozen anyone can have an idea for a book like the hard thing is sitting down day after day even when it's hard and it's not coming together the way that you want it to and actually writing the book um and that's like that's the thing that distinguishes a writer from anyone else is like a writer writes and i'm not a person who believes that you need to like write every day you know i i sometimes i'll see like you know things on like i've never done NaNoWriMo i respect it i know many people who've done it um but like i am not a write every day person i'm not a you know i'm definitely not a like you have to write 1800 words every day sort of person or whatever NaNoWriMo asks of you. Um, but, um, you know, but I think you have to like, you have to make yourself actually do it. And starting out is like generally the hardest part, kind of like making yourself sit down, making yourself close out of social media and the news and, um, you know, looking at a blank page and like knowing that what you put on it is never going to be exactly what you want in your head like all of that um makes it feel challenging and you kind of like would prefer to just imagine this like pure story that you have in your mind that like would be so perfect um if it was on paper um but once you get past that and you start writing like it gets better i honestly every day when i 
like when I actually do start writing, I'm always surprised by like, oh yeah, like, no, this does work. I always, I always think it won't work and then it always does. That's great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sam.